It's only natural that over time things change. As humans, we are particularly susceptible to change. Our taste in clothing might change. Our uh, friends might change. Our attitude may change. And on and on we go with things that could possibly change and, and so forth. Uh, we are people who change. Sometimes the change is good. Sometimes the change is bad. But change will happen. Change is inevitable. In fact, you might even say change is a constant. That's why we are, we are constantly changing. So what should our attitude be when faced with changes? Well, honestly, it depends on what the change involves. For example, if it concerns hairstyle, then change really isn't that big of a deal. Maybe, though, it involves a change in clothing style. If so, once again, it really doesn't matter so long as it's modest and everything, it's all good. And what does modest mean? Well, that's a subject for an entirely different sermon uh, that we might do uh, before too long. But anyway, what if the change involves the Bible? What then? What if we determine that, oh, we've been wrong about what the Bible means uh, for so long, or we, we, want, we change our opinion of what it teaches? What if it involves a doctrine from the Bible that Jesus himself speaks of? Well, as inevitable as change is in the world in which we live, Jesus is unchangeable. In Hebrews 13, verse 8, we are told Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He does not change. And neither do His words change. In, uh, where he says, in, um, Jesus tells us, Math, um, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And you know, if you look at Matthew chapter 24, 35, Mark 13, 31, and Luke 21, 33, they all record those exact words of Jesus. And they're all exactly the same. That is remarkable. Even for the synoptic Gospels, that all three of them would record His words exactly the same way. It's remarkable, but it also must point to how important this is. And how... Uh, how how significant it really is. Unfortunately, there, that's not the attitude of many when it comes to the Bible and change. Many people concerning change in the Bible, they look at the Bible as a book that needs to be quote-unquote updated from time to time. They look at it and they say, well, you know, that may have been applicable and that may have worked in the first century, but that's not for the 21st century. Oh, no. That's not the way it needs to be. We need to, we need to make the Bible correspond and, and agree with our culture rather than our culture agree with what the Bible says. And actually, the second of those is the way we really need to be doing things. There are a number of issues that could be pointed out that uh, show this, but uh, there's one that stands out perhaps far and away above the rest. This morning I want us to explore the topic of baptism. I want us to ask and answer the basic fundamental question, baptism. Is it essential or is it optional? You see, to the modern world, baptism has lost much of its significance and meaning. The vast majority of churches that consider themselves to be Christian no longer practice baptism, no longer uh, it's lost much of its significance and meaning. Um, they no longer require baptism as a prerequisite for church membership. Some churches that claim to be Christian no longer uh, require baptism at, in order to be considered a member of that congregation. They, they no longer require baptism as a requirement for participation in communion. In fact, some places no longer even require baptism for the forgiveness of sins. 
Baptism has become an option for many places, many, many people. More a celebration of an individual's choice rather than an act of God's grace that washes sins away and joins that person to the body of Christ. In fact, there are some even within our fellowship who take this approach. Their rationale is, well, if we don't start accepting people where they are, if we don't stop telling them that they are wrong, then they're going to go someplace that's going to accept them. And, if, and, and we'll never have the opportunity to teach them the truth. My question is, what are you teaching them in the first place? Because it ain't the truth. Because you see, in, every, in the New Testament, every conversion culminated with the act of that person being immersed in water for the forgiveness of their sins. A very legitimate question to start with then might be, what, what, why was baptism practiced in the original church? The answer to this question might help us to understand and know the meaning of baptism. So why was baptism practiced in the original church? Well, one reason is because Christ commanded it. And if you stop and think about it, that really ought to suffice. That really ought to be enough to convince anybody who is sincere about their desire to serve God, to make Christ their Lord, that really ought to suffice for them. Jesus commanded it. Where did He command it? He commanded it in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. Now let me ask you a quick question. We're going to interrupt here. If Jesus has been given all authority, how much authority does Carl have? How, many, how much authority does any person have? If Jesus has been given all authority, I don't have any authority. I read what's in here and I follow it. Plain and simple. It's not open to my own interpretation. It's not open to me saying, well, you know, that was good in the first century, but it's not in the 21st century. That was based on a cultural thing in the first century, not for the 21st century. No. If it's in here, it's for the first century, it's for the second century, the 21st century, the 22nd century, and every century ever. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. In Mark chapter 16, 15 and 16, it says, And he, Jesus, said to them, the disciples, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. That pretty well is cut and dry what Jesus has commanded us to do with regards to baptism. But you see, baptism is not just a meaningless ritual. It's not just somebody getting wet. Okay, baptism without Christ is just that. It's just the person getting wet. Okay, it, it has no significance. And folks, if that's the way baptism is to be interpreted, and if that is the purpose of baptism, and it has absolutely no bearing on a person's salvation, then there is no point in even filling the baptistry with water. There's no point in going to the expense for that. There's no point in going to the expense of making sure the water is clean. Because it really doesn't even matter. It's just getting the person wet. Why was baptism practiced in the original church? Because Christ commanded it. But what did He command it for? What is the purpose and the meaning of baptism? Well, obviously it's for the forgiveness of sins. But, uh, but in addition to that, we, 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 need, we want to look at a more practical explanation. Life has reference points. As you go through life, you experience these ref reference points. For example, your birthday is a life reference point. I'm not talking about the one you celebrate every year. I'm talking about the one when you were actually born. Your life changed. 
You went from existing inside your mother's womb to existing outside your mother's womb. And your life has never been the same since. Your wedding day is another life reference point. When you get married, your life changes. It changes in a significant way. Another life reference point is your day of death. We don't know when that is, but when you die, your life changes. You pass from this decaying, finite existence into an infinite ex existence, into a, a, an existence that you will be in for all of eternity. And in fact, if you were to go and look at most every tombstone in a cemetery, you're going to find those three life reference points. The day of death, the date of marriage, and the date of death. Well, baptism is one of those life reference points. It, it, it's like it is a reference. Since your baptism, your life has changed. Or at least it should have. And it doesn't just change on Sunday morning unless the only time that you're alive is Sunday morning. It changes Monday afternoon. It changes Friday night. It changes everything about your life. And we'll see how in just a few moments. Consider what Paul says in Romans 6, 1-4. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too may live in newness of life. Newness of life. When we come up out of the water, our life changes. Our life becomes brand new. And Paul says something similar in Galatians 3, 26 and 27. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You know, a lot of people want to stop reading in verse 26. By faith in Christ. And yes, that's how you get into Christ is by faith. But faith is not just thinking you believe in God. It's not intellectually accepting uh, your belief in, in God and your making of Jesus Lord. There is obedience involved. How do you get into Christ? You get into Christ through baptism. That is the door. That is the only door to get into Christ. Why was baptism practiced in the original church? Because Christ commanded it and because of the purpose and meaning of baptism. For the forgiveness of sins. To put you into Christ. Bottom line is that baptism is a decisive turning point in your life. There are at least nine things that happen in baptism that, uh, to us that show how it is a decisive turning point in life. The first is that it is the point where the past is healed. It is the point where the past is healed. See, the past has to be dealt with. It does. And every single one of us has a past. Okay, If you don't have a past, then you're not here right now. Because you are here right now, that means you have a past. Okay? We all have a past, and all of us in that past have done things that we are ashamed of. And we must deal with those things in a positive way if we, if, if we are to uh, truly live the Christian life. And it's a major accomplishment in life if we can do this. Because you see, remorse for past failures or sins robs many Christians of the joy that should be theirs. And my friends, that is one of Satan's most effective weapons against a Christian. is to keep on bringing up the things that they did in the past. Keep on bringing up the failures that they've experienced. The sins that they've committed. Keep on bringing those things up so that, it, that he just sort of sucks all the life and joy out of the Christian. 
There's the man who can't forgive his indiscretion 50 years ago that broke up his home. A woman who uh, is in, under the care of a therapist because 10 years ago she had an abortion. And so on and so forth, these things happen and the devil keeps bringing them up over and over again. The only problem with the past is that it can't be changed. Praise God that He allows us to deal with the past positively. And how do we deal with the past positively? Acts chapter 2, verses 37 and 38. Now when they heard this, the people on the day of Pentecost, they heard what Peter said. They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? They don't say, hey, how much money do I have to pay? Uh, they don't say, you know, is there some way we can get it? Their response to Peter's message was there is absolutely no hope. We have done the absolute worst thing that anyone anywhere could ever do. And Peter says to them, uh, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit how do you deal with your past you bury it we have to bury the past things that are buried don't come back no matter what film directors in Hollywood want you to believe things that are buried do not come back. If we fail to bury the past, though, it will come back to haunt us. Baptism allows us to bury our past in the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 9.14 says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? In 1 John 1, verse 7, John writes, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. That word cleanses in that verse, it's in a tense in the Greek language that means it's a continual action. So if we walk in the light as He is in the light, if we're following Jesus, if we are in Christ, then the blood of Jesus continually offers us cleansing from the sins that we commit. Why was Paul able to forget the past? Why was Paul able to, to go on serving God joyfully? Well, he tells us the secret. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul did some things in his past that he had to remember. He couldn't physically forget those people whom he had watched be executed. Those people whom he had participated in their execution. Those people he had thrown into jail for no other reason than for simply believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He couldn't have physically forgotten those things. There had to be another way that he could deal with it though. And the way he dealt with it is through Christ's blood. So he forgets what is behind and, and he's focused on what lies ahead. He can't change all the things he did in the past, but one thing he can do is press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called them heavenward in Christ Jesus. Baptism is the point where the past is healed. Baptism is also the point where we find spiritual cleansing. It's the point where we find spiritual cleansing. David needed cleansing. David did some pretty rotten things in his life. Psalm 19, verse 12, he says, Forgive my hidden faults. He even realized that he maybe didn't know all the bad things that he did. There were hidden faults. Psalm 51, verse 2, he says and prays, Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. In verse 7 of that same psalm, verse 50, uh, 51, he says, Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Psalm 51 was written after perhaps the most infamous 
event in David's life, his sin with Bathsheba. And he says to God, cleanse me. I say, ah, but preacher, David wasn't ever baptized, yet he received cleansing from God. So therefore, I don't have to be baptized to receive cleansing from God. And you would be right, David was not baptized. But David did what God required for cleansing when he was alive. During his lifetime, under the covenant which David fell. He did what God required for forgiveness. Under the new covenant which we live, God requires baptism for cleansing. Because baptism cleanses. Acts chapter 22, verse 16, Ananias asks Saul of Tarsus a very important question. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on His name. In 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 6, verses 9-11, through 11, there is a really sort of long laundry list of things that, well, they're really bad things, okay? And in verse 11, Paul makes this statement, And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Baptism, baptism is the point where we find spiritual cleansing. Baptism is also the point where we are spiritually and emotionally healed. That way we're able to serve God with a clear conscience. Because if we kept, keep on remembering all of those bad things that we ever did, it's going to be really hard for us to serve God with a clear conscience. 1 Peter 3, verses 20 and 21, Peter writes, Because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, when the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism is the point where we are spiritually and emotionally healed. Baptism also is the point where new life is found. John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus teaching Nicodemus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Titus chapter 3, verse 5, Paul tells Titus, He saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal in the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. New life is found after we are baptized into Christ. There was a small country church many years ago that was uh, having a baptism. The baptism, they didn't have a nice baptistry or anything, so they, they went down to a river. And it was a, it was a cold January day. And as, after the uh, person had been baptized and immersed in that uh, probably frigid river, one of the spectators called out, Hey, is it cold? Is the water cold? And the one that had just come up out of the water said, No, it's not cold. And someone else shouted, Preacher, you better baptize him again because he's still a lion. <laughs> every lie, everything that we've ever done, good or bad, doesn't matter is washed away and we come up brand new. It's not that we get a quote-unquote clean slate. We get a brand new slate before God. Never been written on. Baptism is the point where new life is found. Number five, it's the point where freedom is found. John 8, 30-32, Jesus said, it says, and he, as He was saying these things, many believed in Him. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in Him, 
If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth, the truth will set you free. But what do we need to be set free from? It's a good question. What is so terrible in our lives that we need to be freed from it? Well, we receive freedom from sin. Romans 6, verses 17 and 18, Paul writes, But thanks be to God that, that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were com committed, and having been set free from sin, having, have become slaves of righteousness. You see, sin used to be our master. But baptism, when our sins are washed away, when we are forgiven of sins, then we are freed from sin. And if we are freed from sin, we also receive freedom from condemnation. Romans 8, verses 1 and 2 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free uh, from the law of sin and death. We are freed from the condemnation when we are in Christ. And again, how do you get into Christ? Once again, we reference back to Galatians 3, 26 and 27. We are free when we are in Christ and we get in Christ through baptism. Sin can only lead to condemnation. But when we are freed from sin, we are freed from the consequences of sin as well. Romans 6.23 tells us that the consequence, the wages of sin, is eternal separation from God. And we're freed from that condemnation when we are baptized. Baptism is also the point where wholeness is found. Colossians 2 verse 10 says, And you have been filled in Him, that is in Christ, who is the head of all rule and authority. We are made complete when we are in Christ. And again, we get into Christ by being baptized. The next two verses, verses 11 and 12 of Colossians 2 says, In Him you also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised with Him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised Him from the dead. Yes, there is work involved in baptism, but it is not our work. It is the work of God in our lives. Number seven, baptism is a point where justification is realized. When one accepts Christ, baptism is the point where justification is found through Christ. And only through Christ can justification be found. And what is justification? Justification means God's accept acceptance of me just if I'd never sinned. God's grace makes me sinless in His sight. Though I am capable of sinning again, I am freed from those sins. I, I, I'm, I receive justification because otherwise I couldn't be in the presence of God because God's presence cannot tolerate sin. So we must be justified and justification is achieved through this simple act. There are a lot of people who are a little bit confused about when justification occurs. Justification occurs when faith is displayed in obedience in baptism. Some people say, no, 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 no. Justification occurs the moment that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That's all you've got to do. And then you're justified. And then later on, you, you show that justification by being immersed in water. But that's not what the Scriptures teach. Good example, Acts chapter 9, Saul of Tarsus. He was on his way to Damascus. He saw a bright light. For three days, he fasted and prayed. Don't you think that he believed in Jesus? I mean, you know, the bright light, who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. that make me believe. And yet, Ananias still told him, get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away. Acts 22.16 He may have believed. 
He may have fasted, he may have prayed, but he was still in his sins. And he needed them to be washed away. Galatians 3, 26 and 27, once again, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For many of, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Number eight, it's the point where we become members of Christ's kingdom. Colossians 1, 13 and 14 says, He has delivered us from the dominion of dark, domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. In Christ we have redemption. In Christ we have the forgiveness of sins. And you get into Christ through baptism. That baptism is the doorway to the kingdom. It is entry into the kingdom is through baptism. And finally, it is the point where we die with Christ. Romans 6, verse 8, Paul says, Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. Death is a prerequisite to living with Christ. Now what is a prerequisite? Well, let's say that you wanted to enroll in Algebra 2 in high school. If you want to be in Algebra 2, there are some prerequisites to being in that class. You can't just go from basic math to Algebra 2. First, you have to have taken Algebra 1. And you also, and, and, and passed it, by the way. They're funny about that, right? You also have to have taken and passed Geometry. If you don't take and pass Algebra 1 and Algebra 2, you can't be in Al or Algebra 1 and Geometry, you can't be in Algebra 2. Those are prerequisites. If you want to live with Christ, you have to die with Christ. It is a prerequisite. If a prerequisite is not met, it can't, you, can't, you can't have the other. George Mueller, theologian, was once asked, what the secret of his marvelous fruitfulness was as a Christian. And he replied, There came a day when George Mueller died. Utterly died. No longer did his own desires, preferences, and tastes come first. He knew that from, that, from then on, Christ must be all in all. I like what he says there. There came a day, there came a point in time where what I want to do does not matter. What matters is what God wants me to do. What matters is what Christ wants me to do. Things that I used to do, things that I used to even enjoy, I don't do anymore because I've been changed. More than changed because I died with Christ so that I could live for Him. Paul says pretty much the same thing in Philippians 1 verse 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So what's the point? Baptism is the point in your acceptance of Christ that you actually become a Christian as your sins are washed away by the blood of Christ. There is no other way to become a part of the family of God than through immersion in the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of sins. There is a well-known speaker and author, and I chose those words very carefully, a speaker and author whom, whose name you would recognize if I said it, who used to be a part of our brotherhood, who once said, Anywhere I see a man who calls God Father, I see a brother. You know, that would be nice if it were true, but it's not. Let me give you an example. Just because I decide I'm going to start calling President Donald Trump my father doesn't make me his son. I could call him, I could say he is my father, and he would look at, who are you? I don't know who you are. Just calling someone father doesn't make you their child. Now, there are legal means set into place whereby President Trump could adopt me into his family if he wanted to. That would be nice, getting that will. 
but he has to agree to it and I have to agree and there, there's, a, there's a process, proper channels to go through. God has told us the proper channels to go through if we want him to adopt us into his family and being adopted by God into his family, that's a whole lot better than President Trump adopting you into his family, don't you think? He's told us the proper channels and baptism is an essential part of the pro process. Baptism that is done in the right way and for the right reason. You know, I preached a very similar sermon to this once upon a time. And the, one of the people read the title. They said, hmm, baptism, essential or optional? Going to be a short sermon today, isn't it? I said, why do you say that? He said, because essential. Next question. <laughs> There's no way to get around it. What the Bible teaches is that unless you are immersed in the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of your sins, you cannot be saved. If you haven't been immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, what's stopping you? Because whatever it is that's stopping you, I can tell you without a doubt who is behind it. Satan himself. If you know that you are a sinner and you know that those sins are going to cause you to be lost and you know what you've been and you know what the Bible says to do in order to be saved from those sins you know too much not to make that commitment right now. And if we can help you to make that commitment we want to. We want to witness that this morning. Or maybe you made the commitment but you haven't been as true to the commitment as you maybe should have been. If so, we want to help you make things right with God. And if we can do that in any way through a pr public response, won't you let us know by coming to the front now as we stand and sing together.